So thank you, Dan. And so the space bar is the way to go, huh? All yeah. right. So uh, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures. And so first, I want to really thank Neil for setting me up really well for my talk and talking about introducing rheumatoid arthritis and the peripheral mechanisms. But I, do you want me to turn it down? I'm short. So yeah. I'm old and short. Um, so these are my disclosures. So the objectives for the next uh, 30 minutes or so are to describe the characteristics of centralized pain in patients with rheumatic disease and then to discuss management strategies for treating centralized pain in patients with rheumatic disease, primarily focusing on rheumatoid arthritis, which is the most prevalent. So this is an outline of what I want to go over. Uh, first, to just give a generalized overview of centralized pain in the context of rheumatic disease, and then to talk, um, more practically speaking, I think, um, about how one might distinguish say, a centralized pain disorder such as primary fibromyalgia from an early inflammatory arthritis, and then how you may distinguish a flare of secondary fibromyalgia versus flares of inflammatory disease because you treat them differently, and then finally concluding with a little bit on how to manage centralized pain in the context of rheumatic disease patients. And so this was a figure taken from a really great review by David Walsh and Dan McWilliams in Nature Review Rheumatology that shows the many factors that can contribute to pain in um, rheumatoid arthritis, and then how they may change during the course of the disease from pre-morbid to established RA. So as Neil spoke about earlier, obviously there is peripheral inflammation at the joints causing pain. I think the things that we don't want to lose sight of is that there are also maybe other things, such as comorbidities, particularly fibromyalgia. So patients may come in with primary fibromyalgia before they even get RA, and that certainly impacts kind of their perception, their course of disease. And then they may develop more of a secondary fibromyalgia or more of a secondary centralization as well later in their disease after they've gotten rheumatoid arthritis. And so this was a study we did uh, now back in 2013 that looked at the development of fibromyalgia in early RA patients. So we used the Canadian Early Arthritis Cohort, and what we found was that the incidence of fibromyalgia is highest in the first 12 months after diagnosis of early inflammatory arthritis. So during that first 12 months, there seems to be this window where patients are particularly susceptible to the development of a centralized pain state. And we found that this was predicted by high pain levels, uh, poor sleep, and things like that. And then following on this, we looked more at centralized pain in established RA patients. So these are patients with a disease duration on average of about 9 or 10 years. And we used pressure pain threshold testing, which Neil uh, spoke about as well. Basically, a very simple dolorimeter with a rubber tip placed against the patient's skin, and you push. And then you ask the patients to uh, say when they first feel pain. And when that is, it's the pressure pain threshold. So lower pain thresholds equal higher pain sensitivity. And basically what we found was that at joint sites that are commonly affected by RA, so the wrist and the knee, the pain thresholds were lower in RA patients than in controls, and this was statistically significant, indicating at least a level of peripheral sensitization. And then at non-joint sites, so the thumbnail and the trapezius, they were also lower, though not statistically significant in this study, suggesting maybe a component of the centralized process as well. And then furthermore, we went on to look at a more specific measure of centralization uh, specifically targeting the descending inhibitory pathways. And we found basically that the RA patients in blue in the graph shifted more towards the left, so lower um, inhibition of pain than uh, controls that were age and sex matched. And so really I think the goal here is to treat the inflammation, uh, I'm not saying don't treat the inflammation, definitely as Neil pointed out, we have lots of great drugs now to treat the inflammation, to, so to continue doing that, but then as well to think a little bit more about the pain mechanisms and to try and dissect them out, and if needed, 
to treat the pain as well, adjunctively, through many of the strategies that have been discussed uh, yesterday and earlier today. So now I just want to go into some of the more practical aspects, I think, of for if you're a clinician and you're, if you're seeing patients in front of you, how do you tell like, what kind of pain state that they have? Do they have more of this centralized primary fibromyalgia or do they have an early inflammatory arthritis and you really need to get on it and refer them to a rheumatologist right away to institute some of these therapies that Neil just, just discussed? And so I will say that you know it's hard. It's hard to tell. I mean, I think many rheumatologists will say, oh yeah, I know, I can tell right away. But I think when it comes down to it, when you're in the trenches, it, it's hard because they're very similar. They all have pain. Um, most of them complain of fatigue. And you know, morning stiffness, which as Neil mentioned, is kind of the textbook thing that people say to look for for inflammatory disease. You know, lots of fibromyalgia patients say they have morning stiffness as well. And we're told like, you know, an hour cut off is what, when it starts to get to be inflammatory pain, but I will say that a lot of my fibro patients say they have an hour of morning stiffness or even a morning of morning stiffness or an all day. So how do you get down to that, um, what, what's distinguishing? And I think the difference is mainly distribution of pain. So is it all over, um, which would indicate more of a centralized state? Is it more just at the joints? Um, as Neil mentioned, joint swelling is key. He showed some great pictures of joint swelling and how to distinguish between kind of that boggy swelling versus more of the uh, knobby, bony, painful osteoarthritis swelling. And then elevated inflammatory markers can help, though, you know, this also is, you know, hard because there are plenty of RA patients that don't flare with high, uh, high ESRs or CRPs when they're flaring. And then Converse, there are a lot of people that don't have RA um, that might have high CRPs or high ESRs just because of age or obesity or other comorbidities. And so how do you really tell? And so this was an interesting study that as we got down into the literature I found um, by Bennett in 2009 that um, tried to get at this. So they were basically looking at the revised fibromyalgia impact questionnaire. And as you would expect, the patients with fibromyalgia had the highest scores. The RA lupus patients had kind of middling scores. And then healthy controls had low scores. Uh, depression uh, was the other group with similar to healthy controls, but maybe a little bit higher. And then, I'm not sure how well this projects, but they actually went down to the item level, uh, each item on this questionnaire, and, and looked to see what distinguished between fibro patients and RA lupus patients. And then the th three that I highlighted are the top three. And so um, basically the activity of vacuuming, scrubbing, or sweeping floors, interestingly, fibro patients were not um, very able to do that, whereas RA lupus patients were better able to do that. Sitting in a chair for 45 minutes, which was surprising to me because you think RA patients are very stiff, they're not gonna wanna be sitting in a chair for 45 minutes, but actually they could do it better than the, the fibro patients. And then this concept of tenderness. So fibro patients were much more tender than RA lupus patients. And then they went on to look at distribution of pain. And so this was not on the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire, but separate to that that they added to see what sites were more likely to distinguish. And fundamentally, it was arm pain. Um, so not at the joints, but in the arms. Uh, fibro patients had higher levels of arm pain. And then hip and thigh pain, if you look at thigh pain, intriguingly, 55% of fibro patients uh, endorsed thigh pain, whereas 0% in this uh, population of RA and lupus patients did. And then the back. The back was a huge uh, area for fibro patients and the axial skeleton, not as prevalent in RA or lupus. And then they did the statistical method where they put in all the variables and tried to figure out which ones would contribute most to distinguishing. And in the end, they ended up with 15 variables, with the top three being mid-lower back pain, tenderness, and neck pain. And if you included the whole 15 variables, they were able to distinguish uh, fibro patients. Um, they said fibro patients were fibro patients 99% of the time correctly and they were able to distinguish RA lupus patients 90% um, of the time correctly. 
and then they hone down a little bit more on this concept of tenderness versus pain. So I think we often equate tenderness with pain, but you know, I think they are different. Um, and fibro patients, you'll see, have high levels of both, um, but they have more tenderness than pain, whereas RA lupus patients also have both, but tend to talk more about pain than tenderness. And I think in clinic, I see that a lot where patients will say, you know, I have aching pain in the joints, but they're not necessarily endorsing tenderness, um, even when I press. And so then I want to just go through and talk a little bit more about now, let's say you have a patient that you know has RA, um, how do you distinguish in them, you know, whether their pain is due to their RA versus whether it's due to more of a centralized process such as a flare of fibro or something else. And so in, in order to do that, I think I first need to take a step back and uh, explain how disease activity is measured in rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatologists often use um, what's called composite disease activity measures. So these are things like the disease activity score in 28 joints, the simplified disease activity index, the clinical disease activity index. And so basically, they take um, different components and they somehow put them together, whether through addition or multiplication or whatever, to get a score. And so on the right side, I show you a graph of the components of the DAS28, which includes a sedimentation rate, so an objective lab marker, the tender joint count, which the physician presses on 28 joints and asks the patients whether they're tender or not, a swollen joint count assessed by the physician, and a vast global health, which the patient reports themselves. And you can also see the con contribution of each to the score, with the SED rate being the highest, followed by the tender joint count, then the swollen joint count, and then the vast global. Um, I think the thing to really note is that a couple of these measures, particularly the tender joint count and the vast global, are very subjective and highly influenced by pain, uh, regardless of what that pain is. And so you can get elevations of this disease activity marker um, by other causes of pain that are not inflammation. And so this uh, was a study done by Tan et al. that showed with increasing fibromyalgia tender points on the X, you get overall increases in the DAS28 score. So um, the more tender you are, the higher your DAS, regardless of what level of inflammation you have. And in particular, the tender joint count, that little dotted line, skyrockets. And so that's probably not too surprising because, you know, tender points, tender joints, you're both feeling them, they're assessing tenderness. So, but something to keep in mind when you're thinking about assessing disease activity in an RA patient. And as well, the vast global health increases, whereas the more objective measures, the SED rate and the swollen joint count stay steady pretty much across all tender point classes. And so this was a study um, that used the fibromyalgia survey scale, which I believe was talked about yesterday. Uh, so just to remind you guys, on the left, there's the fibromyalgia survey scale that shows the widespread pain index and the symptom severity score. And um, basically, they looked at different levels of this, and it's indicated as PSD on the graph because it's also called the polysymptomatic distress score, but same thing. Um, and they basically graphed what the physician's assessment of global disease activity was on the X, and then the patient's report of pain on the Y axis. And you can see that patients with low scores on the fibromyalgia survey score or low scores of the PSD had a pretty, pretty good correlation. Um, whereas if they go to the high scores, which are the open circles on top, you can see there's pretty much no correlation between the pain and MD global activity. So these are the patients with high centralized pain and less inflammatory pain. And so how do you distinguish? You know, I think there's a lot of clinical gestalt here. There have been things in research studies that have been uh, suggested to be useful. Um, two of these, the top two, look at the discrepancy between the tender joint count and the swollen joint count. So how much tenderness you have versus actual swelling. And then the last um, is a measure of the DAS, what's called the DAS28P, which is a measure of the uh, proportion of subjective components in this composite disease activity measure compared to uh, more objective components. And I'll go into a little bit of these following. Um, 
So these were some studies that looked at the difference between the tender minus swollen joint count. And so they identified this optimal threshold of seven. So if you had seven more tender than swollen on this 28 joint count, they found that it predicted the presence of at least 11 fibromyalgia tender points with 72% sensitivity and 98% specificity, which is what they called fibromyalgic RA. And then to see how this affected uh, disease activity assessments of RA and these composite measures um, are the graph on the bottom with a DAS28 on the left, the CDI in the middle. And you can see that the patients in black, the fibromyalgic RA patients, had much higher scores than uh, the others. Um, but when you looked at more, a more objective, arguably, measure of disease activity, which was a tender and swollen joint count greater than or equal to three and a said rate greater than or equal to, I think, 28, um, there wasn't actually that much difference. So it really affects how you measure these, uh, these, uh, the disease activity in these patients. And then on the right, you see another study, more recent study by Mickelson that also looked at this tender minus swollen joint count. Um, they used different cutoffs here, and they looked at remission assessed by a whole slew of different composite disease activity <coughs> measures in both rheumatoid arthritis on the top and psoriatic arthritis on the bottom. And the bottom line to these graphs is, is that the more discrepant you are in the tender swollen joint count, so the further out to the right, the less likely you are to be considered in remission based on these disease activity measures. So this is just kind of a cautionary tale that, you know, when you're looking at disease activity measures, you need to also consider what other causes of pain that this patient may have, because you may not want to go escalate uh, therapy to the next DMAR to the stronger immunosuppressant um, agent, because maybe in these patients, even though their disease activity composite measures are saying they're high, maybe they're not actually as high as they seem. And then just another uh, illustration of this similar concept, but now looking at ratios instead of differences. And so this group specified the low ratio of less than 0.5 of swollen to tender ratio as to be um, kind of the fibromyalgic patient. So basically twice as many tender joints as swollen. And once again, they looked at different disease activity measures. Here's the ACR20, another composite measure, where if you have low uh, STR, you're less likely to get a 20% response. And similarly, if you're, like, you're less likely to get a 50% response to the ACR50 if you have low STR. And then when you put this in a multivariable model, using, including things such as sex, physical function, steroid use, baseline disease activity, the thing that really predicted poor treatment response was the low STR. And then just one slide on the DAS28 because I think this is a little bit more complicated and harder to do directly in clinic. But this um, group here looked at the fraction of the total DAS28 score contributed by patient reported, outcome, patient reported components, so the tender joint count and patient global assessment and divided by the whole and saw an association between that and fibromyalginess as assessed by the fibromyalgia survey scale. So in the last five minutes or so, I just want to discuss managing centralized pain in rheumatic disease patients. And you know, I think largely it's similar to managing centralized pain in other patients, as has been discussed you know, by other colleagues in more depth um, earlier today and yesterday. Uh, these are the ULAR revised recommendations for the management of fibromyalgia by Dr. McFarlane and, and his, his colleagues. And, you know, they focus on starting with the non-pharmacologic therapies and then adding the pharmacologic therapies. I will say that as with what others have, have discussed previously, patient education is key. Um, I think you've seen the diagram here before yesterday, but really talking to them, spending that time um, to validate um, that their pain is real. And then I think a lot of the studies that other colleagues such as Neil have done in neuroimaging, so I just stole a picture from one of his publications here, are helpful in this and really showing patients, yes, you know, kind of similar to some of the ultrasound images that Neil showed earlier, which showed the red fiery um, images in the joints to convince people that they have joint inflammation. Also seeing that, hey, there's something going on in the head and it is real. Um, there is a lot of value to that because it gets buy-in and it gets them to get with you to, to do the next step, to do some of those non-pharmacologic therapies and to put the work in.
So I think that is probably the key point here. Um, then I will go a little bit into discussing some of the non-pharmacologic therapy. Um, I'm going to just look at the data in patients with systemic rheumatic diseases, as in to contrast what other uh, speakers have spoken up about beautifully um, in fibromyalgia and other states, but in patients with systemic rheumatic diseases. There is some data on aerobic exercise as well as psychological interventions, specifically CBT, stress management, and education, which they lump into psychological interventions. There was a um, systemic, systematic review in arthritis care and re research um, looking at pain um, outcomes for aerobic exercise, and they found that there was a small effect size uh, favoring aerobic exercise for pain in these patients. So a lot of patients will come in and say, well, is it safe to exercise? Will it aggravate my pain? You know, no, it actually will improve, if anything. Um, interestingly, they also looked at joint count, which was more of a measure, I think, of inflammation. Um, they didn't actually see any significant inf effect for inflammation. Um, so arguing that some of this effect on pain may be through more of the centralized pain pathways rather than through the peripheral pathways. And then there was also another review um, in arthritis care and research um, that looked at 13 studies with follow-up ranging from two to 14 months post-treatment of psychological interventions. And they found a small but statistically significant post-treatment effect size with a Hedges G of 0.18. They didn't find any statistically significant difference between types of interventions, so they were only able to look at CBT, patient education, and stress management. And there was no difference between the three, though if you look um, at each of them individually, the stress management seemed to have the greatest effect size. But once again, not a lot of studies, a lot of heterogeneity, a little hard to tell. And then just a brief um, nod to the pharmacologic therapy in systemic rheumatic diseases. There has been some data on tricyclic antidepressants. Um, there's been a little bit of data on SNRIs. And I put anticonvulsants here, though I could not find actually great data on anticonvulsants, but it is something that I do use in my own arsenal, so I thought I would put that there. And so this was a Cochrane review on tricyclics for pain in patients with systemic rheumatic diseases. They were only able to look at uh, a very small number of trials. They looked at pain intensity improvement in the short term, which was one to six weeks versus placebo as well as in the long, longer term, which is greater than six weeks. In the short term, they were only able to find three trials with extractable data on a consistent pain outcome, which was the VAS, the visual analog scale, and two out of three trials favored the tricyclic. Um, they could not do a formal meta-analysis, however, because there was just so much difference between the studies that they, it was impossible to do. Um, when they looked at more long-term, Results, unfortunately, it was less, um, less obvious. Only one out of three trials favored the TCA. Once again, meta-analyses couldn't be done due to heterogeneity in the, in the studies. They did look at side effects. As would be expected, there are a higher number of side effects in patients taking TCAs than placebo. Um, interestingly, there were no difference in GI side effects, but the side effects were more CNS side effects and anticholinergic side effects with the TCAs. So in conclusion, I think TCAs may be effective for management of pain in RA in the short term, though the effect sizes are small. And then one does need to be uh, concerned about looking out for side effects, particularly the CNS and anticholinergic effects. And then uh, we did do a study. Uh, this was a study that Dan and I collaborated on. Dan helped me uh, mentor me through this which was a pilot trial of minlasopran, uh, which is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor on pain in patients with RA. This was a randomized blinded crossover trial, so patients crossed over, they, both, they received both interventions. Um, sadly, the primary analysis was null, so our primary outcome was the BPI pain intensity, and there was no difference for when patients were on placebo versus milnasopran. The thumbnail pressure pain threshold, though, did seem to be um, increased more, so less pain sensitive when they were on the milnasopran than not. And then the interesting part was that in the subgroup analysis, where we really honed down to those patients with only 
one or fewer swollen joints, so very well controlled inflammatory disease, there was a significant difference, and those in the milnasopran group um, that time period did improve more than when they were not on plus, when they were not on milnasopran, and similar effect on the pain threshold with a higher increase in pain threshold while on milnasopran than placebo. And then we also looked at adverse effects, and they were very similar to what's been reported in the RCTs for fibromyalgia. The greatest was nausea at 27% of patients reporting that, loss of appetite in 10%, vomiting in 7%, and sleep problems also in 7%. So I think conclusions here are it's really important to carefully phenotype patients, determine the cause of pain, and we're going to work on more studies to be able to do that. SNRIs may be efficacious for RA patients with very well-controlled inflammation, but side effects uh, were common. So really in closing, I think I want to hone in on these take-home points. One, the characteristics distinguishing between a centralized pain condition and an inflammatory arthritis, tenderness to touch, difficulty sitting for 45 minutes, intriguingly, uh, pain in the axial skeleton, arms, thighs, and then when you have a patient with an inflammatory condition, how do you distinguish between a flare of that versus a flare of more of their fibromyalgia? Maybe look at discrepancies between the tender and swollen joint count or subject to components of the DAS versus objective. And then management, really very similar to primary fibromyalgia. And a lot of what the previous speakers have spoken about today are really important take home points there as well. So just wanna close and acknowledge my mentors collaborators and funders. Thank you.